Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. Hey, welcome back to the latest edition of the bonus content saga here on the Barbecue Central Show. What's one thing that we can agree on in these uncertain times? We all love grills. That's right, all grills, any grills. We want to have all the grills we can in our backyards. And in this episode, I hope to introduce you to two more that you can add to your fleet. But they aren't new to the game by any stretch. So maybe, if anything else, this is a reintroduction. So let's go ahead and race to the hotline and welcome in first timer to the show, Nick Bauer. Nick, how are you, pal? Hey, hey. Hey, Greg. How's it going? I am absolutely fabulous. Appreciate you making time for this bonus content. So before we get into the cooker and uh, talk of all the live fire that you have going on, let's get a little history on you. Where are you from? Uh, what do you? Uh, where do you live now? If you're married, family, all that stuff, and we can get into the business from there. Yeah, awesome. So... Our business and where I'm from is about 20 minutes outside east of a St. Louis, Missouri. So, but we're on the Illinois side. No kids, uh, divorced. I have a dog who's actually at my feet right now, and nice. he's a little puppy. So, he, so he's doing. Uh, he's, he's he's being great right now. So let's hope he stays that way. One of the perks of a family business is I can I can bring my dogs to work with me. So it's fun. So let's start from the beginning here, Nick, as you do some research on Empire. You quickly learn that it isn't some fly-by-night business. Indeed, Empire might be one of the oldest continuously run companies in the country. Can you give us a little history story on that? Yeah, yeah. We're really, really proud of our history. So where I'm recording this, we've been on this location since 1937. So Empire was founded by my great-grandfather in 1932. So we moved into this facility in 1937. It was 30 years old. It was an old stove factory that went broke during the depression. So yeah, so we're very proud. Fourth generation business. It's a, it's the greatest opportunity out there. You know, statistically speaking, it's only about 3% of companies make it this far. And we've had our issues. Each, each generation tends to, my great grandfather had 11 kids. So wow. when my father bought out, he bought out about 55 cousins in the eighties and then bought out my aunt 10, 12 years ago. And so there's good things about family businesses. There's bad things about family businesses. There's no doubt in my mind, this is what I was meant to do in the world. And most days it doesn't feel like work. I will say COVID days have started to feel like work, but pre COVID, you know, I'm working for 13, 15 years now. And most of those days never felt like work. So it's fun. A lot of our customers have been doing business with for 20, 30, 40 years. I have, I, there's friends of mine that are customers that grandfather bought from my grandfather. You know, those type of relationships and friendships, I don't think they're normal in other businesses and ours they are. And that's just awesome. Was there ever a point, Nick, where you didn't think about not jumping into the family business? Or as you said, you, you just knew it was going to be something that you were going to roll into at some point? My grandfather was the fourth oldest son, so he never ran the business. He worked in the business. He was a plant manager. He worked in the factory. He was on the board. And he worked here for 50 years. And I was very, very close with my grandfather. So I got the passion from him. I always kind of wanted to do something else. Unfortunately, my parents decided to get divorced Christmas in my senior year of college. Great time. The business wasn't doing that well. So I, I, I was asked to join. I would love to have done, and this kind of works in the primo. I, I, my goal was to like go to Europe and do business and international business. I love to travel. I love cultures and this and that. So my dream was to do that after college and then come to the business because I was the only grandson. So I was raised with an expectation. I was like, I could choose to do what I want to do, but eventually you're going to need to do what you need to do. So it was my dream to do international business first and then come back to the business, You know, learn from the outside and then come back. I now say, because now we have facilities up in Quebec City, which is the French part of Canada. Now, 20 to 30% of Primo sales are in Europe. So now I'm dealing with like European customers. So 12, 13 years later after college, I've gotten back to my dream. I just had to bust my butt for about 10, 12 years to get there. So I'm pretty, pretty freaking happy with, with how all things ended up. Considering you are now the fourth generation of continuous ownership here, was there a incredible amount of pressure on you to not only take over the reins and keep things going, but continue to grow? Yeah. So historically, we've been on the heating side and that business was declining. So, was, you know, if we wanted to say a certain size, you had to grow on other products and other things. So you went from the heating side to the hearth side, fireplace, gas logs, and now the grill side. So 
you know, there's always pressure. You know, family businesses, regardless of what I do in my career, people are going to say that I'm a trust fund kid and a golden spoon kid and I didn't have to work for it. So I don't spend too much of my time caring about what other people think, quite frankly. And we, we have a lot of fun, too. It's a challenge. We're growing fast. We're doing a lot of different things. We've acquired a couple of different businesses these last couple of years. So it's in most businesses, either you either you grow and you expand and you get better, you challenge yourself every day or you get left behind. And that's not going to happen with us. As you had mentioned, uh, Empire does a lot of home heating, whether it's through zone heating or the fireplace, the stove. And then we have the cookers, which we're going to be talking about here in a second. What percentage of sales is coming from the original or, or the home heating side versus the live fire? Yeah, so about 90% of our sales are on the heat side. So gas logs, wood stoves, fireplaces. We have four facilities across the, the U.S. and Canada that produce products, whether it be a fireplace or gas log or wood stove or wood fireplace or pellet stove. Um, that's the majority of our business. Grills are about 10%. I've been probably spending 75% of my time on Primo and grills this last year since we acquired Primo uh, about 10, 11 months ago. And they're, they're, they're a heck of a lot more fun than dealing with a gas log or a fireplace. So we yeah, absolutely love those last 10, 12 months helping Primo take, take them to the next level. All right, Nick. So let's go ahead and start with the cooker talk. And I wanted to start with the gas side first. In 2002, Empire Comfort bought the manufacturing rights to Broil Master Premium Grills. This isn't a brand that isn't as known as, let's say, a Weber or Charbroil, but for the nerds like me who know the industry, study, and follow, this is a grill that is really unrivaled in two things, loyalty and durability and performance. So tell us a little bit about the Broil Master products and how you have continued to build the brand now 18 years. Yeah, so Broil Master goes back to 1966. It's the longest continuously manufactured gas grill on the market. Before Weber, before maybe those one or two brands before us, but then they went broke or something and stopped for a year or two. So historically, it was your natural gas grill on a post, really thick cast uh, aluminum head. So if you clean gas in St. Louis, if, if you bought a Brawl Master, you'd pay $3 a month for the next 36 months, and then they were just trying to sell gas. So Weber was always kind of the cart model, and then Brawlmaster was the post model. Got it. Unfortunately, as the utilities and less of these guys have started you know, selling appliances, the post industry has really went away. The downside of Brawlmaster is the greatest strength. These, there's a, it's an inch and a half thick. They don't break. I mean, we sell as many, purchase, as many like aftermarket parts for guys who have heads from 30 years ago as we sell new, new grills now because you don't really need to get a new head. It lasts 20, 30 years. So the market just isn't, but you're going to pay two or three times a Chinese grill from Home Depot um, for the same number of burners. And the average consumer just doesn't care. They're like, I'm fine buying a new one every two years. So we've added some stainless steel models to it because your traditional brawl master is not what your wife wants on that outdoor kitchen anymore. She wants a nice looking stainless steel to match the white kitchens and all this. So we've adapted within the brawl master line, but um, it's... You know, the market just isn't, isn't what it was because the things change. And that's okay. That's why we need to keep doing new things to stay current with the market. Are you happy with where sales and market share are currently at? I mean, certainly you always want to get bigger and bigger and gain more market share. But where's the satisfaction level with Broil Master as we sit here in 2020? The market's just not big enough to really spend the resources. So we keep adding stuff. Like we do the same so grills and this and that. But our focus now is really on the commodity market is a lot bigger. Quite frankly, it's probably 10 times, eight times the size of what the Brawl Master market could be. Oh. Just for that, just for the people who's looking for that, that particular grill. But what we're doing now is with our dealers and our wholesalers is they buy Brawl Master and they buy Primo. So for when you're doing your outdoor kitchen, um, you know, people are buying a big green egg and a fire magic. Well, now we have both, you know, buy a Brawl Master and, and, buy, and buy a Primo. Now you're dealing with, with one dealer, one vendor, one warranty. That's really where we're trying to, we're going to bring Brawl Master along is, is buy with Primo trying to make it as easy for our customers. And when I say our customers, I'm talking about the wholesalers and the dealers out there. If they, if they don't have it on the floor, that consumer is not going to see it. What kind of a consumer is buying a Broil Master? Are they the nerdy types like me that are looking for quality over price? There's a fair amount of replacements. So there are still some Hilton heads and these communities that have 15, 20, 30 there on a post and they're replacing the post. A lot of dads that are buying them for their kids because they had one for 20, 20 years. 
Um, it's a, it's probably 75% replacement or referral. Mm-hmm. Someone, you had one before. I'm at, we had a father who gave his brawl master to his son for the wedding gift. And we're like, why don't you just buy a second one? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's a lot of stuff like that. We still get 20 times the number of letters, positive letters on brawl master than we get on hearth products, even though it's a fraction of the sales. Mm-hmm. You know, people are just a lot more passionate about the cooking, um, their grills than they are their, people don't know their brand names of their gas logs or fireplaces. They, they know the brand names for their grills. All right, Nick. So let's go ahead and transition a little bit. As you had mentioned, roughly a year ago, Empire Comfort buys Primo grills. Were you seeking or were you approached by Primo for the buy? And how does that whole business transaction go down? Yeah. So George, who's the founder of Primo, which is an amazing story. He's a Greek guy that moves to the U.S. because he meets his wife when he was her charter boat captain in Greece created this business from scratch back in, in the early 90s. He has been a friend of mine for about a decade. And when I mean a friend of mine, we sell to the same customers. So when we're out socially for dinner, they're like, hey, George, meet Nick. Hey, Nick, meet George. You guys both like to have some drinks? Have some drinks. So him and I started having drinks together probably a decade ago, nine, 10 years ago. And we just became friends. And he had a, he had a daughter who was in college who wasn't interested in the business. And I'm a family business guy. So I'm always constantly looking at other businesses that we share the same customers and good products and they have moats. So, so they have really, you know, when I say moat, I mean, you have good products and you can, you can defend your products. You can't just be knocked off. And 2015 was the first time that I made George an offer. We couldn't agree on a price, but we still remained friends. When I would drive down to Florida, I'd stop at his house and have dinner at his house. And, and then about a year ago, uh, about six months before we closed, we just started talking again, and the timing was just right. So, George is still around. In fact, I just got a phone with him. He's in Greece for a couple of months. He handles all of our European Primo stuff over there. He built a house over there, so he's a great guy. So, he's still involved in the business. I guess I was surprised that people just assumed that we gave him the boot when we bought the company, but no, he's <laughs> he's still doing the new products for us. George is going to be around for many years to come. He's just a good guy, a great story. He was a pharmacist by trade. His dad, his dad owned a pharmacy. But he moved to the U.S. chasing a girl to get married, and they founded this business. So it's just an awesome story. From a, a business question, if you don't mind, because I'm a sales guy during the day, and uh, I fancy myself a barbecue talk show host in the evening. When you guys are initially talking about the buy, is is it a case of you're trying to get best price, and this is his baby, and anything is potentially going to be an undervalued bid? It's hard negotiating with founders. Because they inherently put a value of the business higher because of the emotional aspect of it. Yeah, I probably talk to five to eight people of any before I find one that actually understands the true inherent value. So that's always a challenge. That's why you can probably say it took five years, but that's okay. You know, it, he had to emotionally become ready to let his baby go, and sometimes it takes a while. And I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine selling my business, and if I did, how long that would take me to emotionally be okay with that. Or if I, or maybe I would never be okay with it. From a timing standpoint, it probably helped help me out better because I'm a genius because I bought it pre-COVID. Um, <laughs> at, least, at least I didn't wait till after COVID. So um, from a timing standpoint, he's probably kicking himself in the shin. So, but that happens sometimes. So give me the elevator pitch on Primo for those that aren't familiar with it. Maybe they're just getting into live fire. I think when you think of ceramic cookers. You think of the green one, you think of the red one, and I also think of Primo. It's like the top three. Certainly, there's plenty of other ones out there, but when you think of the top tier of ceramics, those are the three. So give me the elevator pitch on Primo. Yeah, by far, those are the best three. So when I say a moat, like what is unique about Primo that people should listen, pay attention to? And the number one is U.S.-based manufacturing. And just like Empire, 97% of what we sell, we, we make either in the U.S. or up in Quebec. So we're not sending our money to China and, and growing their middle class. We're ma- manufacturing here in the U.S. and we're growing our, our middle class. So that's by far and for most is what I'm most proud of and why when I looked at them five years ago, like this would be a really good fit. And then the oval shape. So we have a patented oval shape. So we're not just like around like everyone else. And that oval shape gives you true two zone cooking. Charcoal on one side, so you can, do, you can go hot and fast on one. You can do low and, and slow on the other. He had a patent on that. There's a reason why no one else has tried it because it's a complete pain in the butt to make, but it's two zone cooking that no one else has. As I said, those those are two things that I always I always talk about. Where is your share of the market on this side in the in the ceramic? I would say our share of the ceramic market in the U.S. is there's a lot of room to grow. 
Would, would you um, equate it to where the pellet market was a couple of years ago? So, so, so Kamado's as a market in general exploded, what was that five, eight years ago? And they kind of peaked and now pellets are kind of knocked them off. And so they had their big grow, 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 peak, peak, peak. And they're probably, the market's probably, well, now after COVID changed everything, but they weren't on that big upswing anymore. Pellets are still on that big upswing. There's still some more room to run there. The Kamado industry, while it may not be the 12 million gas grills sold a year going through big boxes and this and that, that everyone wants to talk about, there's, it's still a pretty big market and it's a higher price point. So when we moved it from Georgia to our facility in Missouri, we made it so we can be five to eight times bigger than we are now because we think that's there's that much market potential for Primo. What kind of a consumer is a Primo consumer or, or what kind of a, a market are you targeting? So I'll just talk about myself and this is kind of embarrassing, but as you mentioned, we bought Brawl Master back when I was in grade school and high school. So I grew up on a gas grill. I got a Primo back in 2015 when I first started talking to George. I didn't cook on it until COVID because I had two gas grills. Gas grills are easy. I knew what I was doing. I had some sales that come over and they would cook on it. So my Primo sat there for five years. Like it was cooked on three times and I never touched it. Because, wow. you know, I didn't know how to light it. It's intimidating. The controls. I mean, I get it. As the average consumer out there is used to gas, I didn't cook on it for five years. So what I've seen with the Primo guy is someone who's had gas for a couple of years. They've started with the kettle. Maybe they had a couple Webers and they're looking to step up. The average guy out there has probably two to four or five grills. We're not telling you Primo is the only grill you need to buy. It is, but I have five, six grills on my deck. I like doing different things. So someone who knows what they're doing, someone who started, um, maybe they started with a gas grill and it, the first two were destroyed in three or four years. They got a, a cheap little Weber kettle or this and that. So someone who who's not afraid of taking that jump like I was. And quite frankly, I was just <laughs> afraid of taking that jump. And then I was stuck. The week when COVID hit in March, we're at our national trade show in New Orleans selling primos and fireplaces. And then I, then I had to quarantine for two weeks when I got back because New Orleans cases exploded. Well I, well, I got two weeks. I got nothing to do. I might as well learn now. And I could go on it two or three times a week. I get it. The average consumer out there, it seems difficult, but it really isn't. If, if I can teach myself how to do it, anyone can teach me how I do it because I am no chef. I, I am no master grill cooker. But it took me about two to three weeks, and I, I got it figured out. I was going to say, once you put yourself in that position during quarantine to learn it, was it really not as intimidating as you were making it out to be three or four years of, of not using it prior? <laughs> Which is a travesty, like by the way. Quick. I can't believe you let that thing yeah. sit on your deck for four years. <laughs> I know. It, it's embarrassing. When I tell that story, everyone laughs at me. But I get it because I, I, know, I, I know how other people feel. Maybe your neighbor has one, and you're afraid to even go to talk to them about it. I was afraid to learn how to light it, but then I got one of those loof lighters and I actually, you know, my inner pyro comes out and I'm just flaming this thing up and I'm having fun seeing all the sparks and all the flames and I feel like I'm doing fireworks. So once I figured out that wasn't that bad, I remember the first couple of cooks, I went and checked the temp like every 90 seconds and it didn't change, even though I kept checking it like 10 times, it never changed, but it's just out of habit, you go check it. So it takes a while. I get it to actually realize that those ceramics hold the heat so well that you don't need to check them. It's a learning curve, but it's really not that bad. Like I said, if I can figure it out, um, anyone can figure it out. Now, unlike some of the other ceramic grill manufacturers, Primo actually offers a gas ceramic option. It's the G420 model. Tell us about that cooker specifically, and I know it's been... You know what? I want to say I might have even had George on my show back when it originally rolled out because it's been years since it's been out. But uh, talk to me about this specific model and how it's currently sitting in the market. Yeah, so that's an interesting story. So back when George and I were talking in 2015, um, we actually helped him do those burners because he didn't have any gas experience. So we have an mm-hmm. R&D facility in uh, mm-hmm. Kentucky that he went and worked with some of our engineers to help design that. Because we're like, hey, even even if we don't do business together, you know, we're still friends, so we'll still help you. So that was probably around 16 or 17 when it came out. It's a higher price point, and it's a limited number of people. We're working on some things now to maybe make some other type models of that. I do believe there's a market out there for making a ceramic, whether it be a gas insert or a gas starter, like or some way to work our expertise with gas into the ceramic market. And that's why it's nice to have some a bunch of R&D guys that get a get a play around and have fun. Isn't there another ceramic manufacturer out there that has 
like a, a gas burner insert that you would put into the bottom? Yeah, of the there's, some, there's, there's some inserts there. Um, I'm not sure how well they perform. So there, there, there are some options there that you, you kind of that you see and you mess around with. You're like, all right, what do we like about this? What do we not, not like about this? We haven't found a solution yet that, but we're proud of that we want to bring to market. But I joke around where I'm, te- I'm testing like accessories, like rotisseries and pizza inserts on the weekends. And I bring my sales reps and my buddies over that we're working. But I mean, we're having drinks and we're cooking. So it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty dang good job. <laughs> so when you're buying a Primo, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from some of the other manufacturers or when they're buying other manufacturers is that they feel like they're getting nickeled and dimed to death when it comes to accessories. In other words, you buy the grill and that's it. It's just the grill. You need to buy all the other stuff to really make it useful and functional. So how does a Primo stack up against some of those complaints? We've heard that, you know, we've been traveling for the last 18 months, six months before the deal closed, starting due diligence. So starting uh, November 1st, we have a new model. It's the it's the all in one model. It'll come with your deflector plates and your divider that allows that split zone and, and the deflectors allow the indirect. So instead of having to buy all the accessories, if because like someone like ninety percent of the people who buy a Primo buy the deflector plates and then about fifty percent of them buy the divider. So now instead of having to buy all these different things, we're just going to have one model. So it ships in one box to make it easy for our dealers, make it easy for our consumers. So if you want to buy it by itself, you can, or if you want to kind of buy the one with all the, with the toys included, you can. So we're just trying to make it as easy for our customers as possible Um, because that's a very valid point. So we heard people say that and we listened. The G420 is one size, but when you go into the charcoal options of the Primo cookers, there's varying sizes. So tell me what the products you offer are and what the typical price points might be just for uh, an idea. So we have a junior, which is a smaller, and we have the large and we have the extra, extra large. The vast majority of people who buy buy the extra large, it, you know, you read all the Facebook messages when people ask what size and like, no one ever complains that they got a grill too big. We're working on a, on a mini mobile version right now. So we're taking the junior, we're knocking off a bunch of the bottom of it taking about 50 pounds. So next year we'll have a mobile one. You can, cause right now the junior is about 130 pounds, trying to get down to about 80 or 90. So you want to go camping or hopefully post COVID, we can go back to tailgating football and this and that. I have a feeling that the mini one's going to be probably end up being the second seller, but vast majority of people buy that XL. And we're, we're, wa- we're launching a new website here in a week or two. And we have it to where hey, this, it cooks 20 chickens or 10 chickens or 20 hot dogs. And so you know, trying to make it relate to people's cooking as possible. So when you when you zoom over the XL, the large, it shows you like the sizes of what you can cook on and this and that. And then we also have a round version. In the past, Primo introduced a round version to kind of compete with China and Mexico. My philosophy is you don't try to compete with China on price. If China is gonna be the price point leader, you let them be the price point leader. So the first thing I did last year was I raised the price of that one. But that one all in is about 900 to 1,000 bucks. So that's like your entry level. And then you can get up to, 1500 2000 2500 depending on an XL and a cart or built in or this and that. So you're not going to compete with, with China on price. It's just, that's just not, not going to happen that way. So, but still 900,000 bucks, a pretty nice open price point for buying US made. And that comes with a stand. When you're talking about accessories, what are the most popular accessories that you're seeing? And are there any other accessories that are in the hopper that you might be rolling out here over the next six months or a year? This is what we're really excited about because traveling there's four or five things talking to customers for the last 18 months is obvious we we need to do accessories is one of them so the most common accessories for primo now is like the deflector plates the dividers that's like a must-have for everyone you have like cast iron searing and you have all these other things but but what's really exciting is the new stuff we're coming out with and that that is a rotisserie with a couple of different basket options and i don't know what it is about a rotisserie and chicken wings on a on a primo but it is absolutely incredible because uh, my grill makes pretty good wings without the rotisserie. I don't know why, but it's so freaking good. I do about once a week. It takes 30 minutes. You don't have to check it. You can. I mean, I did it in the rain last weekend because I didn't feel like cooking a steak when it was raining or cooking other food. So I just threw the wings on and sat inside and watched TV while it was raining. We have a uh, oval drip pans, so that actually fit the oval shape. Because right now we don't really have anything there, and people like make their own. We're gonna have a pizza insert, so you don't have to lift the hood to be taking pizzas in and out. So if you have your kids over and their friends, you need to do four or five, six pizzas. It helps kind of retain the heat. There's a 
chicken and, and rib option we're doing that's oval shaped. I mean, I think our list of things in the next three years is about 23 different things that either improvements or new accessories that we're doing and we mapped out for the next three years. So it's gonna be every six months, you're gonna see something, three to six months, you're gonna see our social, social media influencers launching a new accessory or talking about this new feature. It's been a lot of work to get here the last 10, 11 months and it's gonna be a lot of fun over the next year or two because all the stuff we're working on is actually gonna be coming to market. I'm merely making a speculatory statement here, but is it out of the realm of possibility for Primo to introduce some kind of a pellet insert or, I, I mean, I, I think Vision makes a, a, or is it Black Olive or one of those things is, is a pellet a yeah. ceramic cooker, but is that in the game plan somewhere or do you not even want to mess with that given the Traegers, Green Mountain Grills and everybody else falling in line on the pellet side? Yeah, so that Black Olive was out there for years yeah. before pellets even got got busy. And a bunch of my fireplace wholesalers sold that. So I've seen that. I've messed around with that. At this point, it's not on the drawing board. I bet you if you ask most Primo owners out there, they'd be screaming at me. To, and I've seen them on the message boards. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Focus on what makes Primo Primo. I believe you, people should have a, a couple different grills. If, if you like pellet, you want to have a pellet, there's there's a reason to have a pellet. There's, there's a lot of other stuff that can make Primo better than try to make Primo what it isn't and make it into match a Traeger because it's – it's inherently going to be more expensive. So at this point, we're going to remain kind of focused on on what our customers are asking for, and they're not currently asking for that. And Kamado Joe's has a pellet out there, and I was reading the message boards last night, actually, and it was like 95% of the Kamado Joe owners had zero interest or told them don't do it. And I'm pretty sure my Primo friends will stay the same. <laughs> so let me ask you, you know, when you're the president of, of Primo, so – where does a line fall between listening to customer feedback, taking that to the drawing board, figuring out if it's something from an accessory standpoint that you're going to be able to manufacture, bring to market at a decent profit margin for you guys, at a decent price point for the end user to buy, versus you, Nick, thinking, hey, everybody needs this specific thing, and I'm going to bring it to the drawing board and make it go to market. Are you listening more towards the customers or are you allowed to have great unilateral ideas on your own and bring those to market as well? I'm Primo Nick on Facebook and all the Facebook groups, the Primo official one and the Primo barbecuers. And this is the same thing. So, so I started before I was president, I was product on, on the fireplace side and I did product for eight, 10 years. 90% of the products I've done on the fireplace side and on Primo is not Empire's idea or my idea. It's listen to customers. They know what's best. You know, I wish we had, so the, the groups on Facebook are like 12,000 and 15,000 or something. I wish I had that type of immediate feedback on the fireplace side of my business because I'd be such a better business listening to the consumers every day. I read 90% of the posts on Facebook. The vast majority of the ideas that we've done, has, so I did a post probably seven, eight, year, seven, eight months ago. Uh, hey, guys, Primo fans, what accessories do we need? And I printed out the entire post and we've just had a page, and as we've done them, we've checked them off the list. Did we have some some of the same ideas before that post? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did we get get some new, really good ideas from that post? Absolutely. 90% of probably the product improvements, enhancements have come from the field, come from consumers, whether I get a direct message. And by the way, guys, if I don't respond to your direct message quickly, it's because it probably went to my spam, and I don't check my spam or my Facebook Messenger every day because I try to have a social life too. It's the greatest feedback possible. And it's incredible to have direct consumer information because on our core business, we don't have that. It took some while getting used to dealing with consumers and consumer feedback and consumer warranty, because that's not what we're used to. But it's on the sales and product side, it is incredibly awesome. Nick, where do you see Primo in three years? Where would you like to see it? So the cool thing about Primo is eight of his nine wholesale customers in the U.S. were also Empire customers. So we're now it's it's in our warehouse. So now we're helping our trade partners, less freight, you know, combine programs. Primo really needs to be that number two in the market. You were never going to be bigger and egg. Bigger and egg is a cult following. It's a uh, it's it's a great product. But also the owner of Bigger and Egg is he's older. He's going to eventually have to sell that business. Kamado Joe just sold their business. So when I looked at before I bought Primo, I knew I have a 30 to 40 year run professionally. And I knew Kamado Joe just sold to, to, a, to a PE firm that was probably going to change things. And they have. And eventually Bigger Egg's going to sell. So normally when 
founders sell their companies, the next owners don't necessarily follow the founder's path. So in these next three to five years, I, I, I think we have potential to be to be number two where we should be. And I think in a good 20, 30 year goal, I would love to be number one, but it's gonna take a while and things have to go right in our direction and and competitive stuff has to change. And But we're in a pretty good seat right now because we don't need to make quarterly earnings reports or this year sales. You know, we look at five, 10, 15, 25 years from now. And we're gonna have a, a heck of a lot of fun with Primo over these next three years. And then after that, it's, it's only gonna keep getting better and better. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Nick, give out the social media handles as well so as folks are listening to this, they can dial them right up and start following. Yeah, so I'm Primo Nick on Facebook. We have an official Primo Facebook group and then the Primo BBQers, which is kind of like the unofficial that was started by some of our consumers. I follow that. That's where most of the back and forth goes. On Instagram, we have an official Insta- uh, Primo Instagram um, we have about 15, 18 social media guys that we just started. So Primo just launched their first social media campaigns this year. Well, I guess he had two or three last year, but now we got four or five times that. And then Empire Group Nick. So Empire Group is what owns the various businesses. So it, Empire Group Nick on Instagram is my work one. Breaking it all down from the beginnings of Empire Comfort Systems to where we are present day, the Broil Masters, the Primo, all great stuff. Nick, thanks so much for taking the time, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it. Another bonus content segment in the books, and I thank Nick Bauer, president of Primo Grills, for joining me. If you are in the market for a ceramic cooker, give Primo a look. If you're in the market for a new gas cooker, Give Broilmaster a look. I find Broilmaster more in my mom and pop specialty fireplace and grill shops. But if you're somebody like me, it's always buy the best and only cry once. Check them out if you're not familiar with that Broilmaster. I think it's well worth the look. All the show contact information, all of Nick's contact information will be in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. And we will see you this coming Tuesday for a brand new episode of the Barbecue Central Show at 9 p.m. Eastern. Hope to see you there. Until next time, it's your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.